vast, mysterious universe whose origin and future are incomprehensible to human minds, there spins a small planet that houses a variegated human family. Those of us concerned about the right to be variegated are determined to preserve the wall of separation between church and state and the freedoms ensured by the First Amendment to our Constitution, which begins, Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion, which prompts the question, can the religiously dogmatic accept those among us whose concepts of morality may be very different? And should religious dogma determine the laws of a democratic, secular society, the Ten Commandments, or our Constitution and democratically determined laws? Legalization of prostitution is a hot-button issue in our society. It's a question worth exploration. Food for Thought Productions is pleased to present the first in a series from a conference on human sexuality chaired by Tim Madigan, executive editor of Free Inquiry magazine, who began by sharing his travails in getting the assignment to cover this event. I particularly had trouble um, getting the uh, organization to pay for my entry into the hooker's ball. Uh, but I said, look it, I'm a journalist, this is important, and our senior editor, Vern Bulla, has organized this conference, so I have no desire to be there, but I feel for, for the good of posterity, I must attend. Uh, the one objection, as it were, that, that I personally had is that there was not more discussion on the uh, fact that religion uh, or at least in the Western world, organized religion tends to be one of the principal causes of uh, the stigmatization of prostitution. And I'm very happy that Eddie is going to talk about that. He was able to give a taste of it, but he was very, very good in containing his fire-breathing atheism, as, as was I, and now we, now we can let it loose. Uh, what I particularly liked, though, about the, conf the conference was the fact that it emphasized the sharing of resources. Uh, I attended a session this morning. I was one of the few people who didn't have a raging hangover from the hooker's ball, so I was able to get up at 9 o'clock and be at the, the session in which sex workers from throughout the world shared their stories, talked about their attempts to organize, and, uh, and the fact that, in particular, the Internet is now making it possible for these individuals to, to uh, stay in touch with each other and to have a real organization, a network of international uh, sex workers. Uh, and I, I think, uh, if nothing else, I've learned that when I plan the next humanist conference that we definitely need a little more hedonism. Uh, certainly some of the costumes that people, men and women, were wearing at this conference were much more interesting than the ones they usually wear at our free inquiry conferences. Mr. Madigan couldn't resist expanding his role in this proceeding, which he did by proceeding to share comments of a few well-known commentators on human behavior. The first is from Lord Chesterfield. The pleasure is momentary, the position ridiculous, and the expense damnable. Uh, this, the second is from Woody Allen. Is sex dirty? Only if it's done right. <laughs> The third is from George Bernard Shaw, and it's one that I think will fit uh, Eddie uh, Tabash's talk. Why should we take advice on sex from the Pope? If he knows anything about it, he shouldn't. <laughs> and the final quote is from a great contemporary philosopher, uh, Quentin Crisp, uh, who says, nothing in our culture, not even home computers, is more overrated than the epidermal felicity of two featherless bipeds in desperate Congress. <laughs> and I think after that, there's nothing more to be said. Correction, please. There is considerably more to be said, and who better to say some of it than Edward Tabash, human rights attorney, who speaks out about removing religious dogma from our legal codes. There is something that distinguishes those of us who become humanists from those who remain ensconced in religious doctrine. And that is, those of us who become humanists come around generally to a point of view that there should be no restrictions on human liberty that are not grounded in experiential factors. 
that if something is not scientifically or empirically a part of the human condition, and it is based upon speculation about the will of a never seen or directly experienced supernatural being, that such prohibitions have no place in confining in a legal context the liberties which we human beings should enjoy. We also as humanists believe that even beyond the pale of the law, that we human beings should accept rationally imposed restrictions on what we can do in our interactions with other people if those restrictions are grounded and rooted in appropriate human experience or scientific data. For instance, there is no disparity between the humanist view and the religious fundamentalist view on whether I can go outside and shoot somebody randomly. In fact, I would say if push comes to shove, that the humanist view would regard such an act to be even more egregious than the fundamentalist religious view, because the fundamentalist religious view, at least in the Christian sense, gives me an out. If I declare for Jesus a moment before my death, then the sin of having killed a perfectly innocent human being is wiped away. And yet in humanism, we have no last minute mechanism for wiping the slate clean. So therefore, I would say that humanism in this sense is even superior to fundamentalist Christianity because it does not give a quick and easy escape hatch. And you are not permitted to efface a record of misconduct expecting divine salvation just because you decided to worship the creative force in the universe only through Jesus. So that is what distinguishes us as humanists from religionists. And we apply this concept that our conduct, our laws, and our personal practices as living human beings should not be constricted by religious dogma. We apply this with particular ferocity to human sexuality. And the reason why we do so with a certain amount of defiance is that there is no area of the human condition in which religious dogma seeks to use irrational and unproven concepts to interfere in natural human inclination more than in the realm of sexuality. There is not one area of the human condition that religionists seek to control with a greater iron fist than they do our sex lives and our attitudes towards sex. And so when we, the defenders of human sexual freedom, when we approach the world and advocate for a greater tolerance, we have a dual task. We have to, most significantly, come up with rational arguments for why people should be permitted to do certain things. And that should be the only task we have. But we also have to explain why certain books written by human beings but attributed to invisible divine forces do not contain within them the appropriate basis for restrictions that would confine what we may do with ourselves and with each other. And that is very difficult because you see, there is a major problem in society today and that problem is that people accept some very silly and dangerous concepts, some very, very strange mythologies, some very weird fairy tales as being the highest form of truth available in the universe. People accept the notion that just because in some 
ancient silly book known as Leviticus, it says that homosexuals who have intercourse with each other should be condemned to death, that when they do such things with each other, even though objectively nobody is getting hurt, that it is one of the greatest sins that a human being can commit when objectively nothing wrong is happening. There is a major religious institution in the world today, the Catholic Church, which says that regardless of how happy you were at the moment of marriage and regardless of how you grew apart and how two people grew in different directions or regardless of what major and life stifling incompatibilities have arisen between you and your spouse, unless you fit into the church's mode of dissolving the marriage through something called annulment, you may never divorce. And if you do divorce, and if you do remarry, and the Vatican just reiterated this two and a half weeks ago, you cannot have sex with your new spouse, regardless of how much in love and how compatible you are with them. And when the church speaks, it claims to speak for God, because if it didn't, it would have no reason to speak in the first place. So the unseen, unproven, invisible power is being invoked to limit and constrict the enjoyment of human sexuality. As an activist for church-state separation, the way I like to phrase the ideal society is one in which no one's personal liberty is legally hampered because of nothing more than somebody else's religious beliefs. Now, what this means is that if there is a rational basis for restricting your liberty, if there is a rational basis, which there is for saying you cannot drive 100 miles down the San Diego freeway, then your liberty should be so constricted. But if the basis for the prohibitory law or regulation that would restrict your freedom is grounded on some claim of some divine supernatural being, and it is reducible to only that and nothing in human experience, then your liberty should not be restricted. So the simple phrase, no one's legal freedom should be hampered merely because of somebody else's religious belief embraces all of that. But there's also another major distinction between us humanists and religionists. And that is that we humanists, by and large, never want the laws of the land or the police power of the state to be invoked to impede or punish religionists for how they choose to live their lives so long as they don't impose their views and practices on the rest of us. Yet it is the religionists who throughout recorded human history have been attempting to grab hold of the reins of government and to place their religious-based concepts into ironclad laws which would shackle the liberties of all of us. And that is the real difference. We would never force, we would never force people to have sex if they didn't want to. The religionists would force us not to if we want to. We humanists have never raided or physically attacked priests because they were celibate. But yet priests and their bishops try to impose virtual celibacy, at least outside of a marriage they approve of, on the rest of us. And so not only do we win the comparative contest for tolerance, we win the comparative contest for a true live and let live philosophy. One of the most curious phenomena socially and politically in this country has been since 1980 
the virtual takeover of the Republican Party by the religious right. The reason why this is still such a strange marriage is because the religious right, which wants to use the reins of government to restrict all of our freedoms, has chosen as its vehicle a political party that has as its primary platform removing government intrusion from our lives. And so they want to free the boardroom, but they want to punish and regulate the bedroom. In the handout that I provided, I refer to five United States Supreme Court cases, which essentially, in essence, all say that religious doctrine cannot be favored by government in the United States, and that religious belief cannot be officially sanctioned by any branch of government, even as against non-belief. What that means is that if any law cannot be otherwise justified by recourse to human experience, then that law cannot stand if its ultimate grounding is in religion. I want to give you the example of the case of Edwards versus Aguilard, <clears throat> which was decided by the United States Supreme Court in 1987. Louisiana passed a creation science statute requiring that whenever evolution is taught, so should the spontaneous appearance of humanity. Now, the Louisiana legislature and Louisiana before the United States Supreme Court argued that this was not pushing a religious doctrine. It wasn't necessarily the creationism of Genesis. What they were saying is if you teach evolution, you have to teach as an equal scientific theory that human beings appeared in our present form without going through any stage of evolution. The United States Supreme Court in a majority opinion which drew what to us humanists should be a very chilling dissent from Justices Scalia and Chief Justice Rehnquist, the United States Supreme Court said that when a law is grounded in pure religious doctrine and when claims of experiential or scientific foundation for that law are a mere smokescreen, that that law will not be permitted to stand. The same thing happened in Epperson versus Arkansas in 1968. So the Supreme Court is on record as saying that no lawmaking body in the United States can use a secular purpose as a mere subterfuge in order to get past in order to sneak through what is essentially the enactment of religious dogma. So whether the issue is prostitution, whether the issue is gay rights, whether the issue is even the age of consent, the message that we humanists have to bring to this debate is that the laws that exist must reflect a rational, experiential, and scientific purpose, and that they cannot be based upon religion. Now, in some cases, we will come out, in many cases, on the same side. Rape, child molestation, abuse, any involuntary subjugation by one human being of another in terms of sexuality, we would all agree on. But there are certain areas where we might begin to differ. For instance, Vern dealt with the touchy issue of child molestation. I'm going to touch upon the age of consent. The age of consent in California is 18. In the state of Kentucky, it's 16. Whether or not the age of consent should be lowered to 16 or raised to 21 is beginning to percolate in 
California political discussions. We have to join that debate, not be afraid of it, but our initial contribution to that discussion is that whatever the finished product is, that law should be based on human experience, science, rationalism, and that religion should play no part in the configuration of laws we all have to live under. Whether or not people should be able to rent their bodies commercially for the sexual pleasure of others should also be based upon human experience and scientific research and not based on religious dogma. There is not one facet of controversial human sexuality where the finished product, which means the laws that we have to live under, should be grounded in religion. And so the task and the intellectual contribution, the gift, if you will, that we humanists must bring to bear to the creation and establishment of laws that regulate human sexual conduct is one of rationalism. And this is also how we introduce into society that laws based on religion are invariably unjustified and unconstitutional. Now people will say to us, we already have laws based on religion, murder, rape, robbery, that is simply not true. The fact that religion may have some common sense elements and will be in accord with what human experience has shown is unremarkable. It does not mean that we are enacting religion into law. All it means is that religion and all other forms of human inquiry have converged on finding that this particular topic or this particular mode of conduct should be prohibited. The test is, even if there were no Bible, and even if there were no concept of God, would our human experience still show that the conduct in question should be prohibited? If our human experience would show that the conduct in question should be prohibited, then we can prohibit the conduct. So what we have to do is we have to take the whole host of legal prohibitions that seek to punish and restrict human sexual behavior and examine them under the microscope of rationalism. But most importantly, we have to reopen every question and every topic and discuss it from a rational standpoint and call for a re-examination of all laws that are in danger of having been drafted as a subterfuge to pass religious dogma. And this is what is meant by the separation of church and state, and this is the contribution and the saving grace, if you will, that humanism can give to the hopefully more enlightened process of making laws on the topic of human sexuality and every other area of the human condition. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions and answers. There were questions about violence based on religious doctrines. If I were to stand up and say to somebody, ex-bishop down the street is somebody who you need to get rid of because he's going to make you feel guilty for the rest of your life, and unless you kill him, you'll never be free internally, and they go and kill him, okay, I have then been a participation. But if I stand up and I say the Catholic Church has done violence to your sexuality, to your uh, personal liberation, and they choose on their own to go nuts and go violent, against the Catholic Church. You see, there's a world of difference between standing up and saying abortion is murder, it should be outlawed, and standing up and saying, okay, troops, go and kill those doctors who are killing the babies. Every time you have a new medium, the censors want to focus on that. When we just talk to each other, they would try to ban speech. Once we invented the printing press, they would try to ban books. And then when we had electronic media, they'd say, oh, well, radio waves are different, or motion pictures or television is different. Every time you have a new medium in which 
human beings can communicate to each other, the sensor comes along and says, all the pre-existing media, it's okay to have free speech, but this one is different. Um, the obscenity law is basically in violation of the First Amendment because the First Amendment is a non-majoritarian concept. The First Amendment says that popular majorities cannot restrict your expression and cannot tailor what you say and cannot tailor your religious beliefs to popular sentiment. Because in Miller versus California, the Supreme Court said that obscenity can be defined based on community standards, they have violated the non-majoritarian nature of the First Amendment. If it's legal in Los Angeles, it can be found illegal in Alabama. But the First Amendment is to guarantee a uniform blanket protection for free expression across the country. So I'm quite worried about what the Supreme Court will do. What I'm hoping is that some of our usual enemies, like Scalia, who came through for us and made the one vote we needed in the flag burning case, will have that libertarian streak swallow his religious streak, which happens sometimes. It does happen periodically with him. And that he will, if it's close, will give us the vote that we need uh, to prevail on this. My, my view is that the children and internet comes down to another very important issue, which is, again, showing the hypocrisy of religious right conservatism. They talk about leaving the family alone and family responsibility and family values. Then why do they want the government to do the parents' job? Why do they want the government to turn off the TV when the parents should do it? If the parents can't do it, why are they asking for a government handout? Why should censorship go on welfare and receive tax dollar support? The same conservatives that argue that the family should be left alone and government shouldn't do the job of parenting now want government to be the parent. And I hope the Supreme Court sees through that. We hope you have found this program intellectually stimulating and that you will continue to investigate the ideas raised here. To connect with other like-minded individuals, please contact any of the dozens of free thought organizations, such as the American Humanist Association, American Atheists, the Center for Inquiry, and Atheists United. You may also email the producer directly via leebaker27 at gmail.com. This program has been distributed through the courtesy of Atheist United.